So I was sexually abused from the age of roughly seven um, by my stepbrother, who was three and a half years older than me. Um, and it went on for a decade. Um, so most people don't think of sibling sexual abuse as being with someone so close in age. So he, he was 11 when it started, which, um, as I just said, that most people don't consider that, but it, it, it was sexual abuse. It wasn't at all what people like to think, oh, well, oh, that it's just kids playing around. The, the, the big difference with experimentation is that experimentation is curiosity on both sides. It's inquisitive and it's natural. The big difference with abuse is when one wants it and one doesn't. And that happens not by bruises, not by beatings, but by emotional blackmail. So the emotional blackmail that he exercised over me was, so my mother had died and my father had um, another woman and uh, it, 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 she was like a mother to as well. Uh, she was a stepmom, and uh, the, the the blackmail was: if you tell anybody, my mum will take me away, and you will all lose your second mum, and it will all be your fault. So the the thing is that people say, oh, "Why why didn't you tell?" Well. I had as much vested interest in keeping his secret as he did really, because if I'd have told, yes, the horror would have stopped, but the whole family would have been devastated and as he led me to believe, because all his lies and threats and, and emotional blackmail seems so, so believable when you're, you know, you're seven, eight, nine, it, it, it just seemed so convincing. I mean, I'd already lost my mother. My mother had died. I, I knew what that was like. So then then my father had a heart attack and then the, the blackmail turned to, well, if you tell dad, he'll, he'll have a heart attack and he'll die and it'll be your fault. So I had as much interest as he did in the secret not coming out. So when two children are in a busy house and they're both trying to hide the secret, it, it is possible. So one of the other things that most people don't think about sibling sexual abuse is that, you know, because mo most adults have sex in bed, you know, let's face it. And but children will do it any time, any place, anywhere. You know, it, it's not in a bed because children don't have, you know, I mean, how, how many adolescents have parents that let them bring their boyfriends home you know it doesn't happen so it happened in a busy home in every room in the house whenever he got the opportunity and if he got an opportunity when uh somebody the rest of the family were watching tv well he'd have taken it if the rest of the family were in the garden because it was summer or whatever he took every single opportunity to get near me access to me so um, the, 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 the question of where and when, so I, I would, I tried to count it once really, and it could be, it could be anything because he might not have had an opportunity for, for two weeks, but then in one week he, he might have had two opportunities. So it could, it averaged about, uh, I would say about three times a month for 10 years. So the, to, to not go into too much detail, but to give you an idea, um, it would have been him forcing my hand, putting, taking my hand and physically putting my hand on his penis. It would have been pushing my head down on his penis and holding it on his penis. Um, one of the, the favorite, his favorites was lying on top of me and rubbing himself on his penis on my belly and ejaculating on me. Um, he, um, so he never penetrated my vagina. He, it, it was, it was never, um, he didn't take my virginity, thank goodness. Um, 
I think he knew the risks. Um, and I think a lot of them, the evidence now shows that from recent research shows that that is frequent behavior. Um, he, um, he would get up from uh, ejaculating and pull his trousers up and go off to to whatever he, next he was going to do and I was frequently left with you know the puddle of spunk to what do I do with this but at the same time it could be hey kids come on dinner's ready and I would have to go from being in a horrible horrible state so the the way I survived the, the actual sexual acts was looking at somewhere else. So I'd look at a wall, I'd stare at the ceiling and I would just imagine something else. So I would um, try to not look and not feel. So I, I would always be very, very frozen. Um, and to jump into the reality of, oh my God, I've now got to go and face people. So it, the having to then quickly go down and join the family, um, I would say was equally as difficult to manage psychologically because he would be laughing and joking at the table and I would be sitting there internally absolutely in agony and screaming. So the, the, the way I describe the, the 10 years of the, the childhood that he stole from me was actually emotional isolation and mental torture. So if you can imagine that, you know, a seven, eight, nine year old, whatever, has got nobody to turn to, nobody they can go and cry to, the weight of the whole family on their shoulders, and the most, what I am now finding, and crikey, I'm 59, still, still in and out of therapy, is what I am finding now is one of the main consequences of prolonged um, sexual abuse for a child in the home is that there is no safe place. So the home was scary, frightening. So there was only one place I could go for refuge so it was a busy house. There were seven of us in the house, five children. And the only room where I was safe was the toilet because it had a key. It, it locked. But with seven people in the house, how long could I stay in the one toilet? It was limited. But by God, those were the best minutes of my life because they were the only minutes of my whole life where I knew he couldn't get me. So that is really, it's, it's not just the sexual acts, it's, it's the mental torture, it's the emotional isolation. So um, I really felt that um, I had nobody to talk to, nobody I could turn to, that, um, and, and the rest of life at school was, or, or, or with friends, family, whatever, was a pretend, it was a, I had to pretend that I was happy. I had to, you know, join in the laughs when inside, oh my goodness, I was. So what I learned to do was mask my feelings, not identify my needs. I mean, if I'm identifying my needs, you know, when he's lying on top of me, wriggling himself or holding my head down on his penis, but you know, if I, what's the point of identifying my needs? Because I, I can't, help myself there's nothing I could do I had to squash my needs so that all, all these things have huge repercussions on mental health and and relationship health so going into adulthood um so the, the, the I, I left home when I was 16 that's when the the abuse really stopped I left three days after my last um o-level CSE uh 1979 I got on an airplane and I moved to Paris. I got myself a job when I was 15. And after my, so a few months later, last exam, I got on the plane. I couldn't have gotten away fast, fast enough or far enough away. 
But every time I wanted to come home and see the rest of my family, he would try. And a few times he succeeded and then it, then it stopped. And can you believe it? When it stopped, he thanked me. He said, I didn't, I wasn't able to stop it. Thanks for stopping. So um, when, when this all happens, what you really want is remorse. You want, you want them to say, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I was a right idiot. And I realize now the impact of child sexual abuse is horrendous. How can I make it up to you? Does that ever happen? In my dreams, no. So um, what, what happened with me personally is that first of all, I, I told one sister because I was worried he would abuse her. I told my real brother and he said, ah, now that makes sense because I walked in a few times and saw you. Yeah. My, oh, my, my stepmother walked in once and, and saw him jumping off me and pulling his trousers up. Yeah, yeah, did nothing, told nobody. So my, my real brother, he, he, he thinks he saw it about three times um, and he remembers one specific incident. I, I was in bed and my stepmother brother was sitting on the edge of my bed and I had my hand on his, his penis and his hand over my hand, right? And he thought, crikey, you know, she's having sex with him, as in, that's what kids talk about, and, you know, they're just doing it. He thought, what assumed it was consensual. When I told him that, oh, by the way, I was abused throughout my childhood, he said, ah, uh, but I never considered that at the time. But of course, because ultimately, um, oh, and when my stepmom walked in and saw it, I was uh, probably about 11. I was flat chested, still a girl, absolutely prepubescent, and he was over six foot tall. Now, how anybody could ever think that that is doctors and nurses experimentation and all, you show me yours and I'll show you mine. Uh uh. So, anyway, um, told my brother after my father died I told my stepmother and my stepbrother himself I confronted as part of my therapy one of the healing supposedly things to do is confront your abuser and um, have them apologize I tried that three times and it didn't work so finally um, I decided to go to court went to the police and it went to court. So um, my, my elder sister, she was the last to know in the family, but when we went to court, all the family knew, it was all open, everybody knew about it, but still he was found not guilty. So the other devastating thing of sibling sexual abuse compared to other forms of child sexual abuse is if it's somebody outside the family, when, your parents find out that your, you know, your darling special child or son, you know, daughter or son's been raped, you would be absolutely appalled because it's, it's an outside. Uh, but when it is in the family, the predominant um, need for the family is to hold the family together. So the, the pressure on me was to keep, keep it quiet and keep it in the family. So when I went to the police, the family really was severed and I now have half my family that have sided with my stepmother. So ultimately what I want to say is the devastation is profound in so many ways. It impacts intimate relationships with partners that, you know, all the partners I've had, mental health, physical health. It's had huge impacts on my physical health. Like I've been anorexic. I mean, crikey, I've been suicidal many times. I've got IBS. I've got a uh, core uh, organ displacement inside my body because I was anorexic. So the organs haven't fixed in place. Um, I, I mean, crikey, I've, I've had multiple bouts of, uh, of depression and it, it's, it's just endless. The, the, the impact that this has on society, I mean, th th they say most survivors of child sexual abuse are more likely to have addiction problems, be homeless, go into prostitution, be unemployed, all these things. It's just tragic the impact that this has. It's colossal.
on a child. It is nowhere near experimentation. And the other big difference with experimentation is that it goes on for a long time. No, so when, when he was arrested, he was arrested on 18 counts of molestation, uh, rape, uh, well, I, I forget all the names of the summary charges. So basically what they, they discounted everything when he was a minor, which is a, a big chunk, right? It's five years of the decade, you know, that, that half the abuse they, they discount because they, I, I think, I think it's called Capax Law or something, where a, a minor can't be held responsible for that. But I think, hang on a minute, you know, the Bolger case where the boys, they went to prison for. So anyway, it it, it it's blurry, um, uh, and and I certainly don't agree with it. So he he was um, charged with eighteen counts of assault and sexual uh, rape and, and sexual abuse from 16 to I think he was 21 22 when it last happened so um unfortunately I was 17 when it last happened or 16 and nearly 17 whatever it was but I was over the age of consent the last I think it happened twice after I left the country um and then it stopped so yeah uh does it does it become paedophilia? Mm. Well, I I suppose I'd say no because by then I was a physically a woman too. As in, I was post puberty. You know, I I had breasts, I had pubic hair. I wasn't a child. So um, I mean, he did say to me the last time he asked. Um, he said you know uh, we could do it properly now as we're both adults yeah i mean it's revolting so for me to go to any public uh, so, uh, sorry any family gathering would be utterly revolting for me because he'd be like perving over me like giving me these looks and twinkles like do you want to come out the back and you know uh, and and family wedding wedding pictures and christmas he'd come and put his arm around me and oh oh you know, so I had to stop going to, and I'd had to put my foot down in my family and say, look, it's him or me, but you can't have both. But ultimately, that's no longer a, a question because of the court case. So, um, but I, I, I wanted to say, because I've mentioned going to court, I think it, I'd really, really like to make the point that he was found not guilty. And that was absolutely horrendous because I, sort of fantasize that he might get raped in prison and then really know what it's like so um but i felt okay as in um somehow i felt you know don't get me wrong i i went down a deep 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 dark hole but i didn't feel as bad as i thought i would and it took me a long time to get my head around it and therapy and what I realized is that the burden of holding the family together was no longer on my shoulders. Because when you go to the police and you give your first interview, you hand it over. It's, no, it's not you against the abuser anymore. It is the crown against the abuser. So it was no longer my, well, it never been my burden to carry. It had always been his lie, his secret, and I have always felt better for having gone to the police, even though he was found not guilty. It is such a relief not to carry that burden anymore. Absolutely all of them. They all believed you. Um, the one who said, mm, think it's probably 50-50, i.e she didn't think it was abuse I was my younger sister and the reason was she was prepubescent and he my stepbrother had split up from his girlfriend moved back into the house and I was worried thinking oh my god he's going to abuse her you know she's easily accessible he's going to abuse her she didn't know about sex she hadn't a boyfriend she didn't, and, and I thought if I tell her these horrendous things that he's done First of all, uh, can I trust her not to tell my father? So I sort of toned it down a bit. 
and I didn't want her. So, so the, one, of the, one of the impacts of uh, the abuse on me was that I was frigid around other men for at least a decade after the abuse stopped. It must, I, I think it was 28 before I fancied my first man. It was, you know, a long time of being really, as in I would freeze. If a man came near me, I would freeze, right? I didn't want my little sister to be like that. So I toned it down so that she would just be aware, be careful, but not be traumatized. That I have regretted ever since because it has backfired because she thinks that what she first heard is the reality, not the abuse. Um, my brother first believed me because he absolutely saw it. My elder sister, well, she came with me to one of the confrontations and he, conf the stepbrother confessed it all to her and said, yes, absolutely true. Everything Carol is saying is absolutely true. I, I did all that and I'm really sorry, absolutely. My, the, the, the weirdest thing was my stepmother. So my, my stepmother, I had believed all the lies, all the bullshit he told me of, um, nobody will ever believe you, but then uh, the complete contradiction, but as a child, I didn't put two and two together. Um, but now as an adult, you think, hang on a minute. So nobody's going to believe me, but if I tell my daddy love a heart attack and die. So, uh, uh, but anyway, they, they, they come out with all these things. And as a child, you just, you're so scared, petrified that, you know, it's, it's, it's a horror story. It's the worst horror you, you are. Right. So I thought my stepmom will side with him and they will leave the family and I'll be isolated and all the family and them. The day I told her, she put her arm around me and said, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. Oh my goodness, Carol. I am so, so sorry. And I thought, I'm amazing. Oh my God. She's not going to, the family isn't going to be broken up. She loves me. She really does love me. She believes me. Because I'd, I'd always had in the back of my mind this thing that she walked in the room and she'd seen us. Why didn't she protect me? And I thought, well, she doesn't love me. But then I thought, well, no, she clearly she does love me. But of course, then it went to court and I realised that she'd known all along, but didn't want to lose her family, lose her husband, lose all her children. So she believed me absolutely because she knew. She knew she'd known all along. She just chose not to do anything about it. That to me is almost as horrendous as, as the abuse because she was my stepmom. She was there to look after me. And, and added to that, she was actually an employee before my father married her. She was childminder after my mother died. She was hired to look after us. Yeah, 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 yeah. She was our childminder carer for five years. Then my dad had a heart attack and then he married the, the help because he thought, well, if I die, what's gonna happen to the kids anyway? So yes, I was absolutely believed by all my family. And um, I think there was only two friends at school that I told when I was at secondary school who were like, you've got to be kidding. That's disgusting. That's revolting because he was at the same school and he was like this, all the girls wanted to go out with him because he was so handsome. They just thought he was sick. But after that, everybody I've ever told has believed me because it, it, I think it's blatantly obvious when you, when you see the dynamic. Uh, so the day I told her, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And she said, I always knew that you and, he had a very special relationship. And I hope that one day the two of you would get married. So I think she, um, so ver very often people with trauma um, paint uh, stories in their heads to be able to live with it. And very often it's, forgetting so a lot of people can't remember um, I, I, I envy them because I would love to not remember unfortunately they're, they're, for me I, they were so etched I can't get rid of the images and, 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 and other things as well smells and all sorts so uh, I think she painted this 
idea in her head that there was a romance. I mean, she, she used to read loads of Bill, Mills and Boone romances. I mean, she, her, her idea of the world would, oh, you get swept off your feet and, you know, all these, you know, princes and she, fairy tale brain. And um, on the one hand, that's how she dealt with it, I think. On the other hand, she knew and she was seen on several occasions by myself so i lived in america at the time but my elder sister lived around the corner from her and both of us saw on several different occasions her banging her head on the wall which is not a nice thing to see anybody banging their head on their wall but banging her head on the wall saying it's all my fault I brought that monster into this world. Mm. So I, I think that the reason the family is divided now and she has decided with her biological son and not her adopted stepchildren is because she felt on the day that the police arrested him that she had to choose and she chose her son and she lied in court. I get that. I absolutely get that. I'd like to think that I would never lie in court when somebody does something so horrifically wrong that I know about. But before that day, before that day that she made that choice, from the probably 20 years from when I told her after my father died, so I probably told her in the 89, 90 and it went to court in February 13. So yeah, 30 years, 20 years she knew. No, 30 years, yeah, 30 years she knew. She, the constant, constant nag to me was keep it quiet. You know, what, what can we do to help you, Carol? But you know, we've got to keep it quiet. We've got to keep it in the family. Um, are, you, are you over it now, Carol? Are you, you know, have you turned the corner? You know, because you, you've got to put this behind you and move on. You know, you can't keep them. Um... So I, you know, I did things like, it was, it was a real shock for me because I was always living abroad. I didn't move back to the UK until, you know, the noughties. So I, whenever I'd come back visit in, in her house, there'd be pictures of him. And I said to her, look, you, you, you recognize that he did what he did. You, you said it was awful. So I, you're asking me how you can support me. And I'd like you to remove all his photographs, please, because I don't want to see them when I come in. And she did. And she removed all of them. And she said, you're absolutely right. He shouldn't have done what he did. But when, when it really, really comes to it, ultimately the parents of those children don't want them to go to prison because what they think it is i'm convinced is they think that socially it reflects on their parenting that somehow it would make them a bad parent and that so what they're doing is forgo the poor child who's been abused their ego their reputation is the most important thing so ultimately, I was a sacrificial lamb from, from the day she walked in and saw it happening. I was the sacrificial lamb so she could keep her social and family and status, whatever you want to call it. It's the most selfish act an adult can ever do. So it ultimately, the, there are things we can do to stop this happening. We can absolutely wake up from our rose tinted glasses that yes, sibling sexual abuse happens and children as young as, whether it be nine, 10, 11, whatever they are now. I mean, I know my, one of my stepdaughters had a period, first period when she was nine. You know, kids are going through puberty earlier and earlier and earlier. We have to realize that they have got hormones rushing through them and ultimately it's any port in a storm. They, it doesn't mean they, they want to, they're in love with their sibling and want to marry them, it means they just want to experiment sexually. And if that means they have to talk to them and blackmail them to say, no, you've got to keep quiet and you mustn't tell anybody about this. You know, that's what they'll do. So people have to understand that sibling sexual abuse happens. And it is, if not as, as bad, it is worse than most other forms of child, any child sexual abuse, because that child never, has a safe environment.
And the other thing we have to be aware of is that if we ever suspect it's happening between anyone, if something just looks a bit off in the home or we, we just saw them both running out of the room at the same time or something weird, then confront it. Do not pretend it's not happening because by golly, it will never, ever go away. It will come back and bite you back when whether that's 20 or 20 or 30 years down the road. So whatever my stepmother thought she was avoiding by confronting that day, she's now paying the price for. So far um, advanced in my healing that it, it's not triggering for me to talk about it. So it might be triggering, uh, triggering for, for your listeners to hear this because they, they might, you know, it might really evoke some horrible feelings in them. And I'm, I'm not there, it's easy for me. Um, so I would say if anybody listening to this, that it, it, if they are triggered and they need help, there are now so many charities um, it, 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 even if they don't know who else to call to, they, they can go to the, the GP and say, I need, you know, some talking help. The, the, there are oodles and oodles on the website, uh, uh, on the on the web of the charities that support um, survivors now. You, you, you have to talk to somebody because the healing only starts when we talk. So for all those years, I felt gagged. And if you, you know, it's it's really easy to to... I think make an analogy with that now if you can imagine the mask that we've all been forced to wear with covid but if you can imagine that that is on permanently and it prevents you smiling and showing any emotion and you can't eat with it on you can't live with it on you have to you physically have to move it to drink and eat but if you've got a gag on you that prevents you from ever speaking you only really begin life when you take that that gag off and so now I am able to talk about it and I want to raise awareness for all the other survivors who are not yet that far down their recovery, because we need to raise awareness for this. We need to stop it happening. It is crippling so many millions of people. They, they reckon there must be over a billion people in the UK now, right now, being, but if you think about it, if it's one in five families, there's going to be a million children now who are suffering from this. And they, and they talk about COVID affecting them. No, we, we need a, a vaccine against, you know, child abuse. So I, I just I just hope that this this helps somebody somewhere one day that it helped them on a journey for recovery, because life only begins when you start looking after yourself, because the needs are so suppressed that when we start self-care and looking after our, need, our needs then then we can start living the life we should have been living all along